And now, here is singer-songwriter, broadcaster, audio-video artist, entertainment agent, and your host for the Dharmic Evolution, it's the master storyteller himself, James Kevin O'Connor. And welcome back. It's so good to be back with you guys again on the Dharmic Evolution. Today we are heading south. We're going to academia. Yes, we're going to Blacksburg, Virginia. And we're going to visit with alumni, distinguished professor Scott Geller. This is going to be a treat. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this on so many levels. So I'm glad you guys are here. Let me share a little bit about Scott and what he has done with his life. It's really incredible body of work. I'm happy to share this with you. Um, Scott's an alumni distinguished professor in the Department of Psychology at Virginia Tech and senior partner of Safety Performance Solutions. For five decades, Professor Geller has taught and conducted research as a faculty member and director of the Center of Applied Behavior Systems in the Department of Psychology. He has authored, edited, or co-authored 43 books, 87 chapters, 39 training programs, 266 magazine articles, and more than 300 research articles addressing the development and evaluation of behavior-focused interventions for improving quality of life. His recent 700-page textbook, Applied Psychology, Actively Caring for People reflects Dr. Geller's entire research, teaching, and scholarship career at Virginia Tech, which epitomizes the VT logo Ut Prosum, That I May Serve. In 2018, the American Association for Safety Professionals, ASSP, published Actively Caring for People's Safety, How to Cultivate a Brother's Sister's Keeper Work Culture, by E. Scott Geller and his daughter, Krista S. Geller, Ph.D. This research-based teaching learning manual was designed to help organizations customize an evidence-based process that involves employees in routinely looking out for the safety and well-being of themselves and others with self-motivation. Dr. Geller is a fellow of the American Psychological Society, the Association for Psychological Science, the International Association of Behavior Analysis, and the World Academy of Productivity and Quality Sciences. He is past editor of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1989 through 1992, former associate editor of Environment and Behavior, 1982 to 2017, and former consulting editor for Behavior Analysis Digest, and current consulting editor for the Journal of Organizational Behavioral Management and the Journal of Safety Research. Scott Keller received a prestigious teaching award in 1982 from the American Psychological Association and since then received every university-wide teaching award offered at Virginia Tech. In 2005, he was awarded the Statewide Virginia Outstanding Faculty Award by the State Council of Higher Education, and Virginia Tech honored him with the title Alumni Distinguished Professor. Professor Geller has received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the International Organizational Behavior Management Net Network in 2008 and the American Psychological Foundation in 2009. In 2011, the College of Worcester awarded Dr. Geller the honorary degree Doctor of Humane Letters. So let's get into it. This is going to be a wild ride down to Virginia Tech University. You better strap up your seatbelts and let's go for a ride. Are you a singer-songwriter, author, speaker, or thought leader? Have you been looking for a platform for your career? Well, the James O'Connor Agency has exactly what you are looking for. Find out how we write and produce big, amazing songs on Music Row for authors, speakers, thought leaders, and organisations like non-profit and corporations. We also help singer-songwriters and artists by giving them a platform on Dharmic Evolution, a podcast designed specifically to broadcast your global career, now in 71 countries and with more than 161 episodes of artists all over the world from all genres. We know how to reach your target audience. Are you a dreamer like James? Then reach out today to james at thejamesoconnoragency.com and find out how we can help your global career. Scott, welcome to Dharmic Evolution. 
Thank you, James. Good to be here. I'm telling you, it's uh, I'm so happy to have this interview because um, I mean we've become kind of like good friends after all we've been through in uh, with the uh, you know meeting you the song the story Virginia Tech all the things that have happened in the past I guess it's almost a year now and uh, really really exciting so um, I want to start by um, just talking to you about uh, Virginia Tech and you know. This path that you've been on, I find just very fascinating because um, not too many people can say they have such a legacy and such a a history at one place. And I, I just know there's probably so many stories and, you know, <clears throat> lives that you have encountered a- along your journey. And I want to just uh, ask you, how in the beginning did you get connected to this fabulous university? How did it start for you? Well, you know, that's. That's amazing. And I, this this job that I have here, I'm going into my 50th year next fall, 50 years. And I got, I got this job by a phone call from the department head to my advisor who said he needed someone to teach some human classes. They had built an animal research program and you need somebody to teach human classes. And I just need, and this guy, my advisor said, I got the man for you. I came down here for an interview, didn't even do a job talk. You know, when you, to get a job in the academic setting, you have to do a research presentation to the faculty. I didn't do that. I just came down and met the faculty and he said, you're hired because they needed someone to teach personality and social psychology, abnormal psychology. And I was here. Wow. It was 1969. Well, and where were you like in your life at that point? Um, where were you? Were you you're out of school yet? You were you were where were you living? How did I, it come to be that you just ended up here? I mean, yeah, I was I was my, it was my last year at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, okay. and it was May. It was May. I was on my way to New Jersey to to Ryder College. That was the offer that I had, and I got this. My advisor said, you have to go down there and see Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. That was the title in those days. And that was it. And I've been here ever since. You know, I must say that I have gotten offers to leave and go to other universities, but I always elected to stay. This has been the place for me. The motto is ut prosim, that I may serve. And my mission in life has been to teach psychology so as to make a difference in the world. I love psychology. I think human dynamics, understanding people is key to making this place a better place for people. But people need to understand each other and take the time to listen with empathy and so on and so on. And I'm convinced that if more people learned more about human dynamics, we could make this world a better place. So. Ut prosum, that I may serve, the VTEC motto. And where did that come from uh, originally? Was that from, like, you know, at the inception of the school? Has it always been that motto? Yes, okay. yes. Virginia Tech is the land-grant university, which means that it's not enough to just teach students. We have to extend our teaching to the world. In fact, faculty are are evaluated not only on their teaching and their research, but only on their outreach. That is, to what extent are you reaching out with your knowledge? Our motto a few years ago was putting knowledge to work. So the deal is, how can we make this stuff work for human welfare? And so this has been the place for me because all my life I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make a difference. And I'm convinced that psychology can make a difference. Yeah, I mean, this all ties back to um, you, your brand, all the things you've done with the um, AC4P, and we're going to get into that. But first, I want to ask you about, you know, you and I have talked about this, how there's this this rampant um, ugliness in this country throughout the world right now, and we're suffering from, um, I don't know, I, I, I just, I feel it's like we're all um, just in a bad place with the things that have gone on. And April 16th, 2007 was a really tragic 
tragic day for um, the university and the people there, and 32 people lost their lives. Where were you on that day, and you know what what were the factors that led up to that day? That you know, how did it impact you? I mean, I can only imagine. But um, what was your role in that day, and were you on campus that day? I was not on campus. I was going to go to school, and I got a phone call at home saying, don't come in, Dr. Geller. The school is locked down. And then I turned on the TV, and there it was. First two people shot and killed, and then and then it was 10, and then it was 20, and then it was 32. And of course, we want to remember that there were 33 died that day. The shooter also, and his family was devastated. So, right. And of course, then we saw the videotape that he had gone to the mail, to the post office and mailed a videotape about his message. Listen, this individual was bullied. He was, he was bullied through grammar school. And when he came to Virginia Tech, he had no friends. He lived with three sweet mates who didn't pay attention to him. He went to class with sunglasses and a baseball cap. What I'm trying to say is the culture is partly to blame also. You know, it's right. kind of like behavior doesn't happen in a vacuum. If people would only realize that we're all in this together, the word is interdependent. This world now seems win, lose, independent. It seems based on greed, you know, and that's it, just not the way it should be. We're in this together. And in fact, if we had noticed that the shooter was was just unhappy. In fact, I believe that part of the reason why he did the dirty deed was to maintain control, to, to get control of, of his life in some way, in that terrible way. But I, I just wonder how much of these tragedies are happening around the world these days. We had a shooting today. I mean, is it because we're just not looking out for each other? We, we, we're in this little little make-believe world on our internet and on our Facebook, and, and we're not looking out for each other beyond our own little world. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot to that because um, I always say, like, you know, there's more opportunities take, like, date, dating sites. Well, why is everybody so lonely? And there's, you know, yeah. there's all these dating sites, and people are still yeah. signing up for them. Some, I've met people who are on three and four and five dating sites, and they still can't meet somebody. Because uh, you're right, the, the art of conversation is, is dying a slow death, and our abilities to communicate, like on a, on a very uh, basic level, we're almost like we're forgetting that we, we should be able to do that. You know, there's something missing with that. And, and James, I think it's empathy. I okay. think the word is empathy. Empathy means you try to see it from the other person's perspective. And we're not doing that. People have conversations, and instead of really listening, they're planning the next thing they're going to say. It's about winning in a conversation rather than sharing, rather than empathic listening. Well, you try to really figure out where's the other person coming from, and how can I help? What can I do to help this person feel better about the situation. If they had done that with the killer at Virginia Tech 2007, it would have been a whole different story. Right, and we went on to have more and more and more of these tragic shootings. Um, and, and I don't believe there's there's any one particular answer. You just touched on a couple. Um, I also think there's parenting contributes. I think there's a whole lot of things. Um, I've even heard stories about the Israelis and the way they deal with it. They have armed people in the schools. Where do you come down on is there one particular thing besides is it just empathy? Is it is it, you know, caring for one another? Is there something going on? Why is it so rampant that it, it's it, you know, it's kind of spread like wildfire over the last like 15 years? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think part of it is the top down control. We think the way we influence behavior is to pass a law and enforce enforce it. We become a ticket or click it society. And I think sometimes people reach out to assert their freedom. Sometimes we believe that our individuality is being threatened by top-down rules and policies, by bullying, by the bullies, you know? And right. I think even we could talk politics. I even think we have some of that bullying in politics today. And people are feeling it. 
And I think sometimes people are lashing out to assert some sense of personal control. And sometimes that lashing out is aversive, negative behavior. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about AC4P. And was that in a kind of a response to the tragedy that happened on April 16th? Are they interconnected or was it just... It just so happened that this platform was built out of some other desire. Well, first, I've been talking actively caring since I wrote an editor, an editorial in 1991. The title of my editorial in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis was, If Only More Would Actively Care. So that started way back in 91, and I developed wristbands, said actively caring for people, that we, I gave out when I gave safety conferences. Actually, it said actively caring for safety in those days. But after our tragedy, I need to say, after the tragedy, people showed love and caring, hugging. I mean, after we experienced this, there was more concern. I got hundreds of emails, people asking me, are you okay? So we reacted in a very positive way And my students and I said, you know, couldn't we make a world like that? Do we have to have a tragedy before we realize the need to reach out for each other? Do we have to have that? Can't we just, and that's why actively caring for people then got bigger. Then we put numbers on these wristbands. I'm wearing a green wristband right now. It says actively caring for people, and it has a number on it. And so the way this works, if you see somebody doing an act of kindness, By the way, they're not random. It's an act of kindness that I plan and I think about and I give this wristband to this person and I thank them. Join the movement. Now, this wristband has 10993 and I say, this is the ID number. Go to the website and report your story with this identification number. And then, by the way, don't keep this wristband. Pass it on to somebody else when you see an act of kindness. When you see people reaching out on behalf of another person's health, safety, security, or welfare. That's how it started. You know, tell me about, you mentioned the students um, who were working with you on that. And I think that is is just amazing that students stepped up to get involved with this. Um, Can you share with us some of your, you know, most memorable uh, moments when when you had students coming to you and saying and getting involved and like really, really understanding, like, you know, kind of like they're seeing the the value and they're they're really digging in and saying, yeah, I want to be a part of this. Can you share with us some of those stories? Well, first, I need to tell you that I, I have a research group. We have a research center for applied behavior systems. We have 20 to 50 students every semester doing behavior-based research. I mean, we're studying behavior in a community that relates to human welfare. So I must say that I have a select number of students every semester who are interested in understanding the psychology of making the world a better place. We'll study sustainability. We'll study safety. We'll, we'll study bullying. We've studied all that stuff. So actively caring for people is the umbrella for the research that we've been doing. And I had the opportunity every year to teach about a thousand introductory psychology students. And of course, they hear our story. They hear about the wristbands and and they get excited. We have an actively caring for people club on campus. And this is a group of students who look for ways to spread the notion of kindness, of interdependency, of looking out for each other. So it, it continues, and then it's it's starting to spread. Um, South Africa, for example, has taken on this, this concept in a big way, and they have a website, and of course we have a website, activelycaringpeople.org, and people share their stories. So yeah, I think people are starting to realize that, that we need more of this. We need more of people sharing and caring. And, of course, you created and produced a wonderful song that brings that message here, you know, here to share and care. And, of course, that's our theme song, and it, that's what it's about. And I think it takes music, it takes speaking, it takes talking, it takes stories, it takes 
a movement wristband. It takes a lot of devices to pull this off. Yeah, I have to uh, I have to shine some light on my my co-writer, um, Christine Mercy Johnson, who um, who worked with me on writing that song. And also, of course, you, Scott, this was uh, this was the brand that we took. And so so that's the uh, that's the holy trinity of songwriting right there. The three of us, the three musketeers. So, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. And just to um, just to let some of you folks know who are listening, um the story goes that, uh, you know, we were introduced, Scott and I, by Joanne Dean, who was a, a dear friend of mine for many, many years. And, um, you know, she she relocated to um, uh, to Blacksburg, and I didn't see her for a long, long time. And then we reconnected, I guess, about a year or two ago and, uh, you know, caught up and everything. And then Joanne was kind enough to introduce me to you, Scott, which was great. Yeah. And then I got to learn all about your brand and the actively caring for movement. And I tell you, it really struck a chord with me because, um, you know, I just kind of have a, a very a very delicate soft spot for people who are, you know, down and out or homeless or just you just don't have like things that we so take for granted, clean water you know, food, shelter, all of those things. So I was immediately drawn to what you were doing and, uh, you know, kind of got into like learning about, you know, this actively caring for movement. So I was really fascinated and it was a joy and honor to work on this song, uh, which we're going to play in a little bit. So, um, so to that end, uh, what have the students, uh, thought about, you being now a songwriter. <laughs> You're stepping up, man. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I give a number of keynote addresses around the country, particularly in the field of safety, because that's where I started. Right. And I play the song. Yeah. I play and I play the song in, in my classes. And I, I do want to share this. I want you I want your listeners to know that this is not just common sense. This is not just a fly-by-night thing. This is a book we have. This is 700 pages. This is a textbook. This 700 pages published by Cambridge University Press, which is a very highly regarded publishing company. And my point is that this is 700 pages of research that supports what we're talking about. Of course, the subtitle of applied psychology is actively caring for people. And let me say one more thing. When I say actively caring, the technical word, the academic word is humanistic behaviorism. And some of your listeners might recall in psychology, we have the humanist on one side and we have the behaviorist over here. We have B.F. Skinner and we have Carl Rogers. Humanistic behaviorism brings them together. See, behaviorists, applied behavioral scientists know how to influence behavior. But the humanists know how to get people to accept the technique, the technology. So you bring the two together and you have a very special science of human dynamics. So this actively caring for people movement is founded on science, on evidence-based principles as to how to make this work. You know, for the people out there who want to know a little bit about the song, we're going to play that now, and uh, then we'll go into the story of how we got to this song um, through Scott and I and Christine meeting uh, several times, and I just have to thank you for your tenacious uh, digging in, Scott, because you really, really wanted this to be very special and, and, to, and to hit the nail on the head. Uh, not to be over, overly simplistic with metaphors, but you really, really wanted to drill down and say it, it's got to be just so. And uh, I think we finally came up with, um, you know, what you were, were looking to do. So, all right, you folks, join us in Nashville. Now we're going to Music Row, and here it is, Here to Share and Care. <laughs> You've just- 
just sown the seed to help someone in need. We all love, we all cry, and we bleed. We are here to share. And that was the wonderful Rachel Williams uh, singing with me on that track. Um, so when you first heard that, when we came back from Nashville, were you pleased right away or did you have to listen to it a bunch of times? What did you think? Well, you know, we you made you went through some some changes, too. I mean, yeah, well, the first, demos first, we did didn't like have we did like female four, voice didn't have Rachel. And yeah. So, you you know, it's kind of like continuous improvement. Yeah. And but oh, yeah, when I finally I liked it right away. I mean, I the the, the words hit home. Um, of course, I am a rock and roll drummer myself, so I connected with with the way it came across. Oh yeah, I liked it right away. But we tweaked we tweaked the lyrics here and there. Yes, you know, yes. Until we came up with something that we both really liked, and 
again, yeah, I was very impressed. Yeah, it very. was a, it was just a joyous experience, especially working with the kind of people that we we were you know privileged to work with. <laughs> Um, you know, as you know, I have like a wonderful relationship in, in Nashville with Kim Copeland and uh, on Music Row. So, you know, we're working with people that, that play with, you know, such as Alison Krauss and Dolly Parton and, uh, you know, Tim McGraw. And, you know, th- all of these musicians play with people like that. So, you know, to get a chance to work with them is such a joy. And of course, Rachel, Rachel Williams was, was always fabulous. She always is. And, uh, she did all of the, um, you know, the, the female parts on there too. So that was really, really cool. So, um, the song is done. So now we have a song, we have the books, we have a Ted talk. So what do you (laughs) want to talk about first? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, first, I first, you know, you did tell me, James, that you're, the mu- magicians, the musicians really liked working on that song. And I, I am really taken by the lead guitar. It's it, and you told me it was one take. And yeah, he, did, he must have been inspired, man, because that lead guitar lick in there. When people listen to it again, it is brilliant. It's yeah. It's brilliant in its simplicity, and it, it's you know it, it's catchy. When you can have a tune that's catchy, you've got something. Well, you know no. what it is. It's it's um. I, I've talked to people about this, and I've I've talked to people about this from a production point of view because that's you know that ended up on my album Gratitude that song, and it's my third full length album. And I talked to the mastering engineer Brian Foraker about it, and I said, I said you know the comments keep coming back um, about how wonderful the production sounds, and I was trying to like get my hands around why. And the only thing he equated it to is it's like a chain and everybody does their part. And I'm talking about everybody from the sound of the drums to the way they tune them to, you know, to the way Sean was playing to Buddy Hyatt and Jim Hyatt with the way they're playing everything, the way they tune their instruments and and their attack and the presence. And then to your point, when you have a song that is that has so much inspiration I believe that the musicians, it's like we, we cut this stuff live for the most part and we do it with very few overdubs and it just, it's kind of like a, a feeling that goes around the room when everybody's like locked into it and just feels it like everybody feels it. So like to your point, James was very inspired. I think he's a very inspired guitar player. And that's not the first time he's pulled off something like that, where he just gets his teeth into it. And the guy's a the guy's a master of taking the temperature and the pulse of the energy of the song and the room. And he's just that's all you do is just turn them loose and just make sure you hit record, man. <laughs> he did it, man. He did it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun. I, I still feel the same way. Um, that guitar solo has. You know, a great guitar solo, I always say, is is a song within a song. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it takes you through emotions. And James is kind of a master at capturing those emotions. So uh, that was that was just really, I was just happy to be a fly on the, on the wall or in the vocal booth in my case. <laughs> have you connected with your gratitude today? I think I have something that will help inspire you. It's the brand new release from James Kevin O'Connor. Gratitude, recorded on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee with producer Kim Copeland and team, is James' third full-length album in four years. Ten amazing songs, each one a different story about the emotions, journeys and experiences that you and I have lived. Songs like Dreamer, Jesus Teaches, Tango On and 51 Shades of Grey. And of course, title track, Gratitude. Pick up the brand new CD today with amazing artwork and photography at iTunes, CD Baby and Amazon. Or simply go to jameskevinoconnor.com for your download right now. Send someone that you love a copy of Gratitude today. It might be exactly what they need in their life right now. Gratitude, the new release by James Kevin O'Connor. So, uh, so yeah, that was great. So, so tell me about, um, tell me about the TED Talk, which I find really fascinating. You, you've got like so many hits on that thing now. It's like up to like four or five million people have have viewed it's, this now. It's 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 six million plus. Wow! And it blows me away. As a teacher, 
you know, who wants to reach the public, man. I mean, you realize, I'm realizing it's about 10,000 people a day are listening to that to that TEDx talk. Yeah. A student came up to me the other day after my class and she said, you know, my dad's a judge and he requires his juvenile delinquents to listen to your TED talk and then have a conversation about their life as it relates to what I say about motivation and feeling empowered and so forth in that TEDx talk. Man, you know how it makes me feel. I mean, I, I get teary-eyed thinking about that I a 15-minute talk can get people inspired. And, and I get lots of emails from all over the world. People say, would you be my mentor? Would you coach <laughs> me further? You know, right. I get an email today and I shared it with, with you, James, you know, where this, this person said, thank me. You know, that that they were feeling down and out and listening to this brief 15 minute talk on motivation lifted them up and they took the time to, to thank me. By the way, that's something that's also missing in our society today is gratitude, is yeah. sharing our thanks with somebody. We've got research going on our campus right now. We're measuring how many pedestrians thank the driver at pedestrian crosswalks when the driver stops their car. And in this campus, cars stop at pedestrian crosswalks. But to my surprise and disappointment, less than 5% of the people actually thank the driver for that. You know what? Many of them are just looking down at their cell phone at their, and they're just walking. They're not even looking at the cars. They're just walking along in their own little world with their own little smartphone and so on. And so that gets back to what we were talking about earlier, that people are less attentive to others in, in their life space. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, and um, what you're doing with not only what you just discussed, but the movement is really critically important to make people aware. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, homeless people. Now I was never like as tuned into them or passionate about uh, their, their plight, if you will, until I met Christine and she kind of changed my mind about this or altered my thinking in a way such as, you know, it's it's look, you don't have to be um, a martyr or, you know, a hero or anything like that. But you can like offer somebody a cup of coffee or a kind word or a prayer or whatever and just say hello to them because they don't like being in the predicament that they're in. And there, so many people are in that space. It's just, you know, and it's awareness that, like you said, somebody needs to teach people that there's a way to approach that and let that person know that you're just a kind voice that that is there. You just happen to be there. Offer them a sandwich or whatever. Um, so I think we need more of that. It's all about awareness. You know, I wish every American could spend one day in a third world country. Yeah. Spend one day in Africa. Spend one day in, in a country that doesn't have all the luxuries that we have. I was talking to my daughter this morning, in fact, and she's traveled all over the world with, with, uh, on her job. And she said, when she comes back to our country, she just wants to kneel down and kiss the ground because she really appreciates what we have. And I think maybe that's part of it too. I think we've lacked that sense of true gratitude and appreciation for the freedom for the connections that we have, the luxuries, the choices, there's a word, choice that we have in this country. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Hey, I want to ask you about um, stories that happened to you. Uh, there's some memories, I'm sure. Standout incidences where you had a special student come through, whether it was uh, somebody who went on to get their PhD or somebody who <laughs> went on to do something fascinating, or was it somebody who you felt you were going to lose, but they somehow rallied and they came back. Can you share anything like that? Anything come to mind? Well, you know, you know, I've, I've hooded about 35 PhDs. And from my perspective, that's a big deal. And every one of those students, it's, it's a five year or more interaction with doing research, with, with passing exams, with, and then, for me, that's that's pretty special. So it's hard to choose, pick just one. And then, of course, they go off to a university and the connection is sometimes continues where they call me for advice or I, I co-author a research paper with them. So it's it's a long-term relationship. And again, 
yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of, of having that. But then again, you're right. There are the undergraduate students who I see in introductory psychology class every day. By the way, that's what's keeping me here because they'll come up after class and they'll, they'll shake my hand or they'll say thank you or, or you know, that they show an appreciation. And it's rare, but it happens about every class. Somebody will come by and want to shake my hand, want to thank me. You see, because well, I teach psychology from the perspective of life lessons. What does psychology have to offer people to make their world and their life more satisfying, more productive. So that's been, I teach the second half of introductory psychology every semester. And it is, it's two classes. The first half is a basic psychology, but I get to teach the applied part, the part of how can we use this science of experience? That's what it is. Psychology is the science of experience. How can we use it to make the world a better place. And I must add that a lot of the pop psychology out there is absolutely wrong. And it's so frustrating for me to see that some, have, they've hired an agent and they get their book out there and people read the book and it's not based on science. So again, it's, it's my challenge and my mission, I think, to teach people the science of experience in, so they can use it to make the world a better place. When you're looking out at your students, um, like right now, this, this period, and we're on summer break right now, but this past year, what impresses you most about the kids that you are teaching right now? Is there something that stands out either socially, academically, any, any way at all that leaves an impression on you that impresses you about what these kids are doing? Well, I must say, I've been here a long time. And the culture has changed, you know. It's very much changed. The, the students come in and they're, they're, they want my lecture on their laptop. And so I had to convert all my lectures into PowerPoint so students actually follow my lecture. Some of them do. Some of them are on Facebook during my lecture. So right. my challenge, speaking to four to 500 students, is to keep them engaged, to keep, because, you, you know, in a smaller class, you get them interacting and talking, but I'm the only speaker. And so it's quite a challenge. So I have to have information that will turn them on. So it, it's, but when I get a student coming up and saying thank you, and by the way, a select number of those students end up working in our research center. And again, we have 40 to 60 students, and they're out there in a the community doing research, looking at behavior, we get a baseline level of behavior, and then we implement an intervention to try to increase the desirable behavior, decreased undesirable behavior. And so we test out interventions. And in that process, they're learning the scientific method about people, to learn about people with the scientific method. It's not common sense, it's science. We all have our biased common sense about stuff. And we, in fact, we have our, our confirmation bias where we tend to reject stuff that doesn't fit our paradigm and we accept and read the stuff that fits our paradigm. And that's the way we live. And the science of experience is different than that. We try to see all of the sides of the coin, you know, to see the total picture. So as a professor, what do you consider the most challenging part of your responsibilities? Wow. I think the most challenging part of my responsibility is get the students off their cell phones. Uh, okay. Get the students yeah. paying alert. Now, I talk about B.F. Skinner in my class, and some of your listeners might have remembered the rat in the Skinner box, and they push a lever, and they get a food pellet, and we change the schedule of reinforcement, and it changes their behavior. Right. Well, I tell my students they are carrying around a Skinner box or an operant chamber all day long. They push buttons, and they get immediate consequences for pushing the buttons. We have to compete with that. That's not easy. No, I it's mean, not. We have it's, distracted driving. We have distracted walking, for heaven's sake. So so this operant chamber, this button-pushing, reinforcing machine, that's what it is. It's a reinforcement machine, and that's keeping our attention, and it's keeping us away from empathic interaction with other people. So let me ask you this, because I was going to circle around to this, but um, <laughs> you already did. So what, what does the school policy... Um, or is there no policy about cell phones? It's just that it's just permeated into every corner of our lives, obviously. But but do you, can you 
create rules in your classroom saying uh-huh. I want to restrict, you know, being on social media while I'm trying to educate you with what my lesson plan for the day is, right? <clears throat> That's a very interesting question. And some of my professors, some of my colleagues actually say no cell phones, no computers in my class. I take it just the opposite. I want to, they can have all they want. And my challenge is to keep them off of that machine. So if I'm an an enthusiastic and an uh, instructor that that can get them away from that machine, I I can say, look what I did. Um, So I, 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 I do not like top down rules. I want students to make a choice. I tell them it's your choice. You don't have to come to class. I don't take attendance. You choose to come to class and you choose your it's an opportunity. You don't you get to come to class. You don't got to come to class. It's not a requirement. It's an opportunity. So I want my students to see it's choice. It's a sense of increasing your competence. Everybody wants to feel good at doing something worthwhile. And it's a sense of community. Those are my three C words in my TED talk, matter of fact, about if we want people to perceive choice, if they perceive community and a sense of competence, they're more more likely to be self-motivated. And I think much of life is about self-motivated to do the right thing. So you must be a hell of a tennis player. You like competition. <laughs> <laughs> I used to play a lot of tennis. But well, it's like, it's, like, it's, it's kind of like, I kind of, I, I like what you just said because it's, it's like, listen, you know, you can choose the phone or me, you know, here's where the education is and the phone is, you know, it's very passive. So, uh, so I admire that, that challenge, you know, throwing that down. Tell me, tell me about what you do besides um, when you are not writing because you're an author as well as a speaker and thought leader. And I want to get to, to that also. Um, when you're just doing chill time, when you need time to just take for yourself, what do you enjoy doing most that takes you out of the VTEC zone? Well, you know, like you say, I did play tennis and but I'm not, and I, I now I don't play tennis, but. I bike ride. I exercise at least an hour every day. And so that's my way of escaping and stuff. But I must tell you, I'm very much purpose purpose driven these days. I mean, much of my my free time is scholarship, is, is writing. You know, I don't have that many days left and I spent 50 plus years doing research. And so I know what the world needs to know to make this world a better place. And I don't want to leave this place without doing all I can do to get that message out to people. I've tried many ways. I've written two novels, you know, to try to teach while people are reading this novel, they're learning. I've done a number of DVDs. As I showed earlier, I've got a a textbook. I've I've written a book for schools. It's right here. I've written a book for police officers all on the basics of applied psychology to make the school teacher and the police officer more effective. And I've got the same basic principles in a book for, for college students. And these, these just came out. So I'm spending much of my time now um, trying to write for the world. My latest book is called Seven Life Lessons from Psychological Science. No, no, I'm backing up. 50, 50. Life yes. I was going to say, what happened to the other 43? This is, this is seven, <laughs> but now it's, it's 50. And again, it's, 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 it's purpose-driven. I mean, it's like I want the world to know what I know about the science of experience. And if they could apply it, if they could teach others, just take the movement, for example. I want more people to understand what this movement is all about. You know, I'm wearing a wristband, and in fact – I have a blue wristband here. This blue wristband is what police officers use. Police officers have this, it says, actively caring for people, and there's a number on it. They have their own website, actively caring for people policing. And when a police officer, after they get the training, when they see an act of kindness, they take this blue wristband off their wrist and they give it to that citizen who did an act of kindness. It's all about recognizing people 
for reaching out and helping others. And of course, the citizen is told, go to the website, report the ID number. This particular number is 502-709. Tell your story, and then you pass it on to somebody else, and they will tell their story and go to that website. And all of a sudden, we have positive gossip for a change. We have people passing along stories that reflect actively caring. Fabulous. Hey, tell me about your um, your speaking tours. <clears throat> favorite favorite place to go, country, city, uh, where have you spoken <laughs> that is your fave? It's got to be Hawaii or something, right? <laughs> I did go to Hawaii. Yeah. I, I think one of my favorite places is a long place to go there is Australia. Okay. Um, because they really have their their mission in the government is duty of care. I mean, not that everybody follows it, but that's one of their philosophies, duty of care. So imagine I bring in the actively caring for people movement into their culture and people say, yeah, th that's what we're about. So Australia was was really a fun place. I've done a number of speaking engagements there. But um, did you go to Sydney? Or whereabouts? Melbourne? I was in Sydney and Melbourne. Okay. And, um, um, I wasn't out in the bush. My daughter was. She was out there working, working the, the process. But um, yeah, and it's you know it's it's a special place. But listen, nothing's better than than United States of America. I mean, we sometimes we don't realize it, but you go to other, other places and you come back here and you say, wow, how lucky we are that we have this. And I, I just wish we would would pay more attention to that and and understand that it is about people. It should not be top down. We should not have bullying. It should be choice and interdependence. That's the word. I don't know. I've been raised and most of your listeners perhaps were raised independent. Nice guys finish last, gotta blow your own horn. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know. Right. But that's independent. Interdependent is more of it's collectivism, not not individualism. It's collectivism. And those are some of the things we have to teach people in our culture to make this world a better place, an actively caring for people place. Yeah, you're so right about um, the United States. I mean, my dear friend and songwriting partner, Christine Mercy Johnson, has lived literally all over the world. She's been everywhere and she's British. You know, she was raised in the royal family. Uh, Lady ah. Lady Di is her cousin, um, ah. and she says the same thing. There's just nothing like the United States is is just a fabulous place to be, you know, and and probably one of the safer places to be still. Hey Scott, tell me about when you let's circling back to VTech, which I find to be such a fascinating place. It is, um, you know, if anybody wanted to look at the value of academia, that you just take them to VTech and and say this ah. is. This is a little bit of paradise here. So, so when you look out at the the you know the journey that you've been on, what are you most proud of? Um, besides what you've done, you know, with your particular career, but just your affiliation and association with Virginia Tech University, what are you most proud of about that special place? Well, you know, I have been to a number of universities, and I must say, right now. No university beats Virginia Tech in terms of facilities. The Hokie Stone um, and the culture here, the, the Utprosim culture. I mean, it is pretty, pretty special. So, um, like I say, I, I, I'm, I'm not ready to leave. You know, I'm not ready to leave this place. And it's it's in that way, it is very special. And, and I'm grateful. My TEDx talk, by the way, when I'm giving my talk, Virginia Tech is in the background, so I'm pleased to know that six million plus people see the term Virginia Tech, and they might wonder, what is that? Of course, it is not a technological school. Right. It, is a, it is a university that teaches other subjects than engineering. Um, but and, and I've been on a number, I'm on a number of research grants right now where the engineers Boy, they have the science, man. They know they know how to make the world a better place from an engineering perspective. But guess what? The National Science Foundation and the people who are funding their projects, they want the human dynamics side. They it's not enough to be an engineer. You have to understand the human side. Because there's there's a human there, and the human is using the engineers technology 
how can we make that technology fit the human side? So psychology has a place, and that's why I love this field. It has a place in every dimension, whether it's journalism or architecture or engineering, um, agriculture. Psychology has a place. Human dynamics plays a role. And so that's why I've been pleased to be at this university and teaching these students who are from these various areas in the in the business department. Um, we have College of Businesses so well known as well as engineering and then education. But psychology plays a part in every one of those colleges. Yeah. Thirty nine thousand. Is that still about the going rate of attendance with uh, yeah. New Tech? Yeah. 40, yep. That's wow. and, and we have. Yeah, and that's just undergraduates. And we have, um, what, 10,000 graduate students, too, beyond that. So well, it, it's a special place. I must admit, it's a special place. And one more time, the fact that one of our mission is outreach. There are universities who will basically do your theory, do your research, do your science. That's it. That's not enough at Virginia Tech because we're the land-grant university one of our missions as a faculty member is to show how what we're doing helps the world. It's called outreach. So when I'm evaluated every year, they evaluate me in my, my teaching, my research, my scholarship, and my outreach. And that's pretty special because that puts a little pressure on all of us to make sure that what we're teaching and researching has a connection to the real world in terms of making the world a better place. Yeah, being being held accountable just makes you rise to the occasion, I think. I think we all need that, you know? <laughs> so uh, if we don't get it from somewhere, we need to find somebody to, to help give it to us. So as we're wrapping up, I just want to comment that um, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for allowing me to uh, make my small contribution uh, with this song to the movement. I think it's really special. I'm so happy that Joanne Dean introduced us and thank you to Christine Mercy Johnson and for my, my co-writer and to Kim Copeland, our producer in Nashville. Uh, this was a really special song. I think we're uh, going to see some great things from this as far as it touching lives uh, everywhere. And also just any parting thoughts that you would like to share with your students, with um, your staff, with anybody who needs to hear anything from Professor Alumni, Professor Scott Geller. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I first need to say that it, it amazes me how all the pieces are coming together, how I kind of met you at, at Joanne's house and, and how we started talking and how that came together and evolved into a theme song how uh, John Drebinger is, is, is making our new website, activelycaringpeople.org, work and more powerful. And, and it, it's so people are coming together. And again, my students, every year I have another group and, and it, it's, it's inspirational. And it, it really is. And I can't believe it's random. You know, I'm believing more and more in divine intervention, that, that, that this is the right place to be, that actively caring for people is something that the world needs. And I think that, you know, there are some powers beyond us that are, have brought us together and have, are making this work. And I, I look forward to more and more of this thing moving and happening. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by all of it. And I'm grateful, James, for you making this happen. You know, this is this ivory tower is just an ivory tower. And if we can't reach out to the world with what we've learned within this ivory tower, it's nothing. It makes no sense. So our our job as teachers and researchers should be to disseminate to the world what we found that others can use. And that's been my mission for several years. And I'm, I'm trying any ideas that, that you might have. And again, this is just one, one way. And I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by the need. The world needs this. And there are people who understand that. And by the way, I want people to hear us as a teacher. No, not me, the teacher. They, the teacher. I want them to, to believe these concepts more than understand, to believe them, and then to teach others. Our legacy is teaching and learning. That's our legacy. What have you taught 
others? And what have you learned so as to teach others? I think that's, you know, I think there's nothing more powerful to think about what your legacy is. And if it's about learning, if it's about teaching others useful information that they can use to make for more life satisfaction and a better world, what more could we ask for? All I can say is God did some job. I'm just glad he included me in my small part. <laughs> I say the same. It's my small part. You yeah. got a bigger part. He orchestrated this whole this whole journey for us. So, Scott, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the Dharmic Evolution. Thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed it. I know you uh, inspired and touched many people. And, um, you know, let's just continue to be here to care and share, my friend. Thank you, James. Kevin O'Connor, I appreciate you. Thank you. Did you ever stare into darkness and look for the light? Have you ever felt compassion that makes your heart come alive? A simple act of kindness will nurture a spark in your heart. You've just sown a seed to help someone in need. We all love, we all cry, and we bleed. So step out of your comfort zone and please do not be afraid. Compassion, comfort, and kindness are virtuous foundations laid. Know what it feels like to be lonely, hungry, and cold. A smile will arise as you give yours away. We should feel this way every day. We're all here to share and actively care. We all have this special yearning that's burning inside. I think it's called love. Yes, it's all about love. This actively caring for movement is founded on science. A TED Talk with over 6 million views. There must be something going on here. Check out Scott's website, The Actively Caring for Movement. It's ac4p.org. ac4p.org. That's actively caring people. And you can check out all about his brands and what they're doing around the world to make this world a better place. If you have not yet gone over to the Dharmic Evolution Community Facebook page, you're missing out. If you're an artist and you're looking to elevate your platform, looking to find out about this show, go find out what we do for other artists around the world in 71 countries. Yeah, put up your video, your new song, your new album. Do you have a tour date? Did you just shoot a video? Whatever you've got going on. Share it with us. Share it with the world. Let us know what you're up to. Also, if you're looking for coaching, a lot of you are. I have three areas that I'm really, really good at and I want to share and help you guys. Podcast training, life transition, or media coaching. I can help you in any and all three of these areas. You may be lost in podcast land and not know how to get it together. You may be a cubicle rat and lost in corporate America. I know there's so many out there, right? You just got to get out and do your own thing and you're not sure where to turn. Or you just may need some help on figuring out the intense and confusing maze of social media and find that you have been spinning in a circle. I know, I know, I know. If any of these frustrations sound familiar, reach out to me, James, at the thejamesoconnoragency.com. I can and will help you get the wheels firmly back on the track. I also want to share with you, if you have not heard it yet, the new Storyteller series is out now on the Dharmic Evolution. Doing it at least a couple of times a month where I take you in the studio with me and I share all the stories. We're starting with the Gratitude album, 10 songs, one song per show. And I tell you stories about who played on it, who's hot in Nashville. Pretty much everybody playing with me is hot. That's why I hang with these guys, because I want to be hot like them. And uh, Kim Copeland, her team, uh, I tell you all about how we go in and we tear a song apart, put it back together, and lo and behold, we have an album just like that. So check out the Storyteller series on the Dharmic Evolution. More Than a Reason is out right now. That's DE-166. I also want to invite you to please stop by iTunes and give us a review on the show. If you have not, please subscribe, rate, and review the show, this Dharmic Evolution show that is now around this world in 71 countries, uncovering talent everywhere around the world. So 
Uh, if you would do that, the show uh, would really benefit and the other people um, that are on this show would benefit as well. So that's it for me today. Your host for the Dharmic Evolution, James Kevin O'Connor, singer, songwriter, audio video artist, master storyteller, and uh, international talent agent. Also, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So until the next time, when we meet again, I'll either see you on the socials or I'll see you from the stage. <laughs>